1942, shortly after the attack at Pearl Harbor, an attack by the Japanese army on an American naval base, which destroyed a significant percentage of the American fleet, which was at Pearl, Pearl Harbor that, that day. Just shortly after that, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR as he was more popularly known, the president of the United States, issued Executive Order 9066. This executive order authorized the relocation, as it was termed then, the relocation of Japanese Americans to a number of relocation centers in the United States, the majority of which were in the western part of the United States. Over 110,000 Japanese Americans, the majority of whom were American citizens, were incarcerated in these so-called relocation centers. Some people have called them intern internment camps, and some even have called them concentration camps. But today, I'm not here to discuss that. Today, I'm here to discuss a book on a subject about which I would wager very few Indians even know anything, much less anyone else in the world. And this is the book that I want to discuss, The Deolivalas, The True Story of the 1962 China Chinese Indian Internment by Joy Ma and Dilip D'Souza, published by Macmillan in India in 2020. Um, this is one of the very, very few books on the subject, and certainly the only one that has been written in recent years and that is written for not so much really a scholarly audience, although there are, of course, notes, but written for a more generally, you know, curious, uh, educated readership, uh, a general, broader readership than the scholarly world. Um, and, and, and this is important because uh, I think that this book doesn't offer the kind of analysis, in-depth analysis that one might really expect of a scholarly work. But the chief merit of this book lies in the fact that it is really, as I said, one of the first books on this subject, and it is certainly very readable. Uh, and therefore, I want to discuss the book as much as the subject of this internment itself. Uh, the occasion for this internment of Chinese Indians was, of course, the war between China and India, a short war that began on 20th October 1962. And this short war ended on November 21st with a unilateral ceasefire uh, declared by China. China clearly at the upper hand in this conflict, there's no doubting that whatever anyone in India might tell you, anyone who's, you know, suffused with nationalist fervor, particularly at this time of the year, given that India has just celebrated its um, uh, 75th anniversary of its independence, uh, there is but no question that India was absolutely subdued. Uh, you know, Indian forces uh, were subdued by the Chinese army. Uh, and India was, in fact, as is generally acknowledged, caught completely unawares uh, when the Chinese launched their lightning strike. Um, uh, J John Dalvey, for example, who was charge of the 7th uh, Brigade of the Army, uh, this brigade was really destroyed and he was taken captive. Um, he was taken prisoner on October 22nd, um, just two days after the war began. Uh, Tawang fell on October 25th, and on October 30th, Krishna Menon, the Indian Defense Minister, resigned, right? But this book, but this book and my talk, neither of them are really about the war. What they're about is the fact 
3,000 Chinese Indians at a time when Jawaharlal Nehru was the prime minister. And Jawaharlal Nehru, of course, had acquired a reputation the world over as a person of very liberal disposition. He had been, as all of you know, a key figure in the Indian nationalist movement. Um, and he had, of course, become India's first prime minister in 1947. And he was prime minister of India at this time in 1962 and remained prime minister, of course, uh, until May of 1964 when he died from a heart attack. Right. So this is important because the question is, how is it that 3,000 Chinese Indians were incarcerated? In detention or concentration camps, there was barbed wire around the camp. So we have to think of it uh, as more akin to a concentration camp, which is certainly the case with the Japanese American concentration camps or internment centers as well. But there are some marked differences. One of the marked differences, of course, is that there was a substantially larger number of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated. Uh, but that, of course, had to do with the fact that it was a larger population. Um, and once again, I reiterate yet again that I don't really go into the politics of the Japanese American incarceration because there's a huge literature on that, some of which I know quite well. And I may in due course actually discuss one or two of those books. Uh, but I think the comparison is useful to a degree because the most striking difference is that the Japanese Americans were taken into these camps. They were first rounded up. Uh, so for example, the ones who lived in California were rounded up if they lived in Southern California and Los Angeles. They were these centers where they were asked to come. Uh, and then from there, they were taken to these uh, camps. Uh, there is a camp uh, about uh, three and a half hours uh, from where I live on the way to uh, Yosemite National Park. Right? So uh, they were taken to 10, 10, 12 different camps and it was a larger population. But what is most significant is that they were taken there during the course of the war and then were released almost immediately after the end of the war. Some of them began to be released before the end of the war, partly because there were Japanese Americans who actually even fought in World War II. And so I think that the American government felt obligated to start releasing some of these people and particularly people who were elderly and women and children. So some started getting released before the end of the war, but certainly by the end of the war and very shortly thereafter, days, weeks ahead, all the Japanese Americans had been released. In India, by contrast, the people who were interned, the 3,000, a much smaller number, reflecting the very small population of Chinese who had been living in India, and I'll very briefly, very, very briefly advert to their history, but in contrast, these people were interned pretty much as the war ended, some of them, and then more of them began to be interned after the war had concluded. And most of you, all of you will be astonished as I was to find out on reading this book that some of these people were not released until 1960 seven, five years, almost five years after the conclusion of the war. How did this happen under the dispensation of a, an allegedly liberal prime minister, right? A person who had been forging, uh, 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 you know, links with the global south, who was an advocate of uh, the solidarity of the people of the global south. You know, there is a kind of apocryphal legend. Uh, I, I say apocryphal legend because really that's what it is. Uh, there's never been any evidence to, to suggest any merit in the argument. And what I'm referring to is this idea uh, which the right wing uses in particular to attack Nehru, namely that 
uh, Jawaharlal Nehru uh, was offered a seat uh, on as a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations, and he turned down this seat saying that China being a larger country at that point with a larger population was just as deserving, if not more deserving than India, and that it was sufficient that one Asian country be represented. And because he believed in the Chinese and the Indians being bhai bhai, being a part of a brotherhood that he was willing to give up this seat for China. Well, you know, this has never been never been documented. But I'm simply adverting to this because I'm saying that there is no question that Jawaharlal Nehru was a person who had acquired a reputation as a person of liberal disposition. Uh, and the question is, how did these Chinese Indians get interned? Why did they stay in these camps, in this camp for that long? And how does one start thinking about the people who were interned and the historical fact of the internment of the Chinese Indians? Does this suggest that something like this could happen with other minority populations in India in the future? Right? So I think for this reason, this book is, is important as well. But the subject is, uh, as I said, intrinsically interesting. And uh, I need to begin with a very brief mention of this camp and the title of the book. Once again, the book is called the Deoli Valas. Uh, the, uh, Valas, of course, Vala is, uh, as um, uh, many of you will know, uh, anyone here familiar with an Indian language, that this is a suffix. Uh, so, for example, Sabzi Vala, the person who sells um, uh, 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 vegetables, Palki Vala. Uh, the person who carries a palki or a palanquin, right? So the Dioli Valas are the people who stayed in Dioli. Dioli was a camp, a prison camp, uh, if we can call it that, in Rajasthan. And this camp had been used um, to actually imprison freedom fighters um, uh, under the colonial period uh, in the 30s and 40s among the people who were sent there were uh, Jai Prakash Narayan, um, Jawaharlal Nehru himself, uh, Muhammad Ali. The camp was closed in February 1947, and then it was reopened uh, after the partition in September 1947 to accommodate refugees. And there were, in fact, actually 10,000 refugees who were accommodated uh, at this particular camp, right? Um, so the, the, so the camp had been around. It, these barracks were not built, I, I'm just trying to suggest, for the express purpose of lodging the Chinese uh, Indians. So when did the Chinese come to India? Uh, the Chinese, um, they, you know, it's the Hakka Chinese come to India approximately around um, 1780, around 1780. And... Um, uh, the population, their population was always um, rather small. Uh, the 1871 census uh, mentions 574 uh, Chinese in Calcutta, 531 in Bombay. The 1901 census mentions 1,640 Chinese in Calcutta. Uh, and it is estimated that in 1945, uh, there were approximately 26,000 250 Chinese in India. Uh, now you might ask yourself, uh, were they citizens of India? And here the answer is that we do not really know if they were all citizens of India. But what we can say with certainty is that virtually all of them, virtually all of them felt Indian. They had lived in India their whole lives, their whole lives. And when they were sent to Deoli, the guards there were astonished to find that most of the Chinese knew either Hindi or Nepali. Right? 
they, they, they may not be entirely fluent sometimes in either or both of these languages, but many of these people did speak Hindi and some of them of course spoke Bangla because the people, the Chinese, the Chinese who were brought over to these camps were brought from certain districts of um, West Bengal, uh, from Assam, uh, from cities such as Shillong, uh, Tinsukia, Digboy, Dibrugar, uh, Makum, um, and several others. Right? Um, and uh, there were enough Chinese in India, certainly in, in, in the Northeast, um, uh, and uh, some in West Bengal. Uh, there were enough Chinese that there was, in fact, actually even a Chinese boarding school that in the 1940s had 300 students, a Chinese boarding school in Calcutta called King Kuo Hok Hao. Uh, now, going back to the question of citizenship, uh, what is important to say here is that in 1962, if someone, for example, said that, well, you know, they didn't have citizenship papers. Let's supposing that you, you're talking to someone who's a proponent of state power. Uh, or someone who simply says that, look, we have to be realistic, that in a war, this is what countries do. The United States, after all, incarcerated these Japanese Americans, the majority of whom were actually American citizens. Not all of them were. Some of them were Japanese nationals who happened to be in the United States, uh, either in on business uh, or for some other purpose. But But most of the Japanese nationals would actually have been people who had been resident in the United States for many years and simply hadn't gotten citizenship up to that point in time. Um, what's important to remember in the Indian context is that very few people in India would have had what we might call, quote, citizenship papers in 1962. And in fact, even in 2020, there are probably a huge number of people, I would go so far as to say the majority of people, who couldn't really show citizenship papers. Yes, you could now show a Aadhaar card because the government has been pushing people to getting an Aadhaar card and has made it difficult for them to get Russians, for example, unless they have an Aadhaar card. Right? But, but let us not forget that the Anti-Citizenship Amendment Act demonstrations had to do in part with this whole question of the Muslim fear that some of them may be deported from India, right? Or be actually put into camps because they couldn't prove their citizenship. Uh, and, and it becomes particularly difficult for women, as I just mentioned in a lecture I gave a few days ago, uh, it becomes particularly difficult for women to prove that uh, because um, very often you find that bank accounts and properties are in the name of men, not women, right? Um, and certainly, when we go back to that generation, very few people in the country would have had citizenship papers, right? So what I'm saying in short is this, it is very clear, uh, this book uh, certainly makes that argument, it could have made it more forcefully, but you might say that that is a style of the authors, that they are not that didactic, they don't want to push the arguments too far, it seems to me sometimes, but the argument namely here being that there's absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing that justifies the internment of Chinese Indians. I mean, this is an extraordinarily disgraceful chapter in the history of modern India, a chapter about which almost nothing is known. And there's very, very little work on this question. All right. So some of the people who spent uh, as long as five years in these camps. Uh, one of the authors of this book, Joy Ma, uh, 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 she was four years old when her family uh, was released from the camp. She was actually born in Theoli and the camp itself, right? And... Um, uh, one of the things that you find in the book uh, is you find, obviously, stories of some of these people. Uh, just to give you a little flavor of that, uh, and once again, I need, I, I should say that, you know, um, 
I think that one of the one of the ways in which the book is somewhat inadequate is that you don't really get that much of a sense of camp life, even though you hear some of their stories. You know, uh, how do they pass their time? Uh, uh, the authors point out that mealtime was very important. People would gather together. Uh, people look forward to the time when, you know, when when they could have a meal. Uh, but, you know, what were the kinds of games that children played over there, for example? Uh, how did they really keep themselves occupied? Uh, did they build up certain kinds of narratives? I think it would have required a lot more oral history than than you see in this book. They certainly did speak to people, obviously, who had um, uh, gone through the experience uh, of these camps. And, um, uh, you know, it's important that there was no school in the camp. So uh, we don't know, you know, how really children occupied themselves, although I suspect that children know how to occupy themselves really quite well uh, when there's actually no school. Uh, because schooling, of course, is something that has been socially regimented in virtually every society uh, that we that we know of, right? But uh, here is a um, 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 you know trying to find the the page uh, where there is a uh, an account uh, that I wanted to share. Uh, for example, what you know what happened when they were brought to a camp. So page one fifty two. 153, um, you get a little sense of that. So here uh, they're talking to, um, um, uh, you know, they're, they're talking to one of the people who went through uh, the camp, a woman. Um, she remembers well the first night at Deoli. They arrived in the evening and had to line up to register. They waited in line for hours. Finally, it was their turn to be called into a little building to register. Her father wrote their names and gave up all his money and her grandmother's jewelry. Some of it, they would never get back. Right? And this is a story that is told a number of times, similar kinds of stories. Uh, there was what was called the custodian of enemy properties. Okay, This is an office within the government within the central government, the custodian of enemy properties. So these internees, their properties, their assets were all confiscated. And upon their release, their assets were returned to them, but very often they didn't get back everything. Sometimes they got back nothing. This is mentioned uh, a number of times uh, in the book, right? But it's very interesting to think about this custodian of enemy properties. So. Let me go back to that passage on 152. So they were assigned to an area called a wink in the camp. She remembers it as a Darjeeling area. That is that it, these were the internees who were all been brought in from the Darjeeling area, right? Since none of the families had been assigned houses, the first thing they had to do was to pick a house for themselves. And when we're speaking about a house, we're not speaking about obviously, you know, a full-fledged house. What we're talking about is barrack buildings. So a house here means a barrack building in which there would be bunk beds. Uh, so, a, a, you know, dormitory style. Right? It became a frenzy. People were scrambling around looking for the best accommodation. Since her grandmother could not move anymore by that time, they decided to take something close to the gate so she wouldn't have to walk. They found a room in a couple of cots. When they settled her grandmother in, they were finally able to lie down until the next day. Right? Um, and, you know, this person describes the problem uh, with feeding all of the people here. The cooks hired by the camp had never cooked for so many people. They were trying to cook as quickly as possible. But in those early days, they kept running out of food or worse. Right? And so on. So, you know, you do get a little bit sense, a little bit sense of the camp. Uh uh, the only how it was run, uh, what were the experiences of the people, I think that we can get a, a thicker or deeper, a richer ethnography of that, perhaps um, in a future uh, work. Um, and as I've said before, 
the most important thing that emerges from a reading of this book really is one's awareness of the very fact of Chinese Indian internment, which is something that has been completely glossed over and obscured in the histories that we have in the popular imagination. Um, we have to consider the fact that the Indian government obviously passed uh, uh, legislation uh, related to the internment, a legislation which continues to have implications down for the present day, because to understand, and that is one other reason I think one, one should look at this, to understand some of the recent uh, protests in 2020, um, late 2019, December 2019, moving into 2020 before the pandemic struck, uh, and, and um, the prime minister um, issued the orders on March 24 that the entire country would go into a lockdown. That period there, the three months preceding that, when there had been three, three and a half months when the Shaheen Bagh movement took place, that that demonstration, the anti-CAA protests were linked up to the legislation that actually emerged at this time, at the time of the Dioli internment. So for example, on November 13th, 1962, India amended the Foreigners Act of 1946. And in January of 1963, on the 14th of January, India passes the Foreigners Restricted Areas Orders Act, right, uh, which kept foreigners out of Assam, out of Meghalaya, out of five districts of Bengal. Uh, this act is still, of course, operational in India. It is the act that is used to still exclude foreigners from what are deemed to be you know, sensitive areas. Uh, but there were very draconian aspects to this with respect to the Chinese and the implications for them. So for example, if only, even if only one grandparent, grandparent was born in China, that grand, grandchild could be declared a foreigner, right? This is mentioned on page 71 of this book. And I think that we would need a far more extensive discussion, particularly a legal discussion of that implication. Um, and obviously a discussion um, of whether there is a kind of a legal history after that, uh, where the Chinese, you know, did the Chinese Indians at some point begin to contest this legally, even long after the internment uh, was really over, right? Uh, so uh, this is the subject matter of the book. I, you can go through it in three or four hours. Um, and I think uh, some of the questions that emerges, which are not really answered, as, such as why were Indians kept in these, why were Chinese Indians kept in these internment camps, some of them until 1967. I'm not saying that all of them were released five years later. Some of them began to be released, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, by 1964. Um, and what was the logic of interning them after the war had ended, right? After the war had ended, after, after China had unilaterally declared a ceasefire and pulled back its troops. Uh, you know, so was there some, was there continuing anxiety on the part of the Indian state, right? And what of course, inadvertently, the authors end up doing, I mean, they don't really have any kind of philosophical reflections on these kinds of questions, but they end up inadvertently making us think about how has the foreigner been evaluated, been treated, been viewed in India historically over a period of time, right? I myself have uh, often argued that India has a very rich tradition of hospitality, okay. of being hospitable to the other. But this incident here suggests that the cancerous project of being a nation state, becoming a muscular nation state, perhaps later on, this cancerous project was already beginning to tear into India. And I think that if one thinks and reflects on that, this book 
acquires more poignancy and resonance. Thank you.